And now moving on, um, our next session is going to be Jill Guerra from University of Arkansas, Fort Smith, and Catherine Benito from University of South Florida, Tampa. Um, they're both involved in an NSF Transforming Undergraduate Education grant to create guided inquiry materials for calculus and pre-calculus based on the POGIL method and philosophy, which I am sure they will tell us what that acronym stands for. Um, but they're going to talk about that and some, the availability of some upcoming materials. So I present to you Jill and Catherine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Catherine. I'm Jill. I'm still. Um, and we're going to talk to you today about um, Pogol, we're going to call it. Go ahead and move to the mic. And uh, we would like to thank the organizers for inviting us to speak here. And because the theme is, as many people have said, the many faces of inquiry-based learning, this is a particular approach. And there are some differences with the traditional pure uh, more method. So we're going to talk about that. So before we go into the details of what Pogol really is, it does stand for Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. So guided inquiry, a lot of people already know what that means and we're going to talk more about that part and the process oriented in a little bit. Um, but um, this is a learning method that started in chemistry classrooms, so a lot of you who have chemistry co colleagues may have heard of it before in, uh, in the early 90s. And um, some of the characteristics of a Pogol classroom are that students work in groups of three or four on guided inquiry activities. And the instructor is a facilitator, so not the authoritarian figure that we were talking about last night. And um, this method did start in chemistry and it started at a liberal arts college and expanded to um, many other universities, including small and large classroom settings, private and public universities. And um, it extended to other disciplines also. It's um, become big in biology, um, some other areas, anatomy. And also it's expanded into the high school curriculum. Um, and it's just starting to make its um, impact on the math community. So um, I'll just tell you a little bit about the impact of Pogol again before we talk exactly about what it is. So it started at Franklin and Marshall College in small sections of uh, general chemistry, sections about 24 students. And there were a number of years where um, there were some faculty members involved in lecturing. Um, and then after that, they started implementing Pogol. And so these same instructors that were doing the lecturing versus the Pogol um, uh, worked in these small sections. And they studied the student uh, success. And so the big um, thing that all the administrators are interested in are the, the infamous DWF rates. Um, and they looked at the differences in um, their classrooms, in the lecture classrooms versus the POCO classrooms, and you can see um, the effect here. And one of the things that's powerful about this diagram, I think, is the, well, of course, the reduction in the DWF rates, increases in the A's and the B's. And um, it's powerful because there are a large number of students over a large number of years. So that was uh, statistically significant for them. So not only has this been used a lot in the chemistry classrooms that are small, like at, at Franklin and Marshall, but we have some more data that um, this is just two sections, but there has been, this is the information from these two sections, but these were large classrooms. And so um, a lot of, a lot of uh, clicker technology was used in these classrooms. There were, there was, this was one lecture and one pogol. Um, the students were randomly placed in these sections, and the final exam was created only by the lecture instructor. Um, so this is the a diagram of the withdrawal rates and the final exam scores. So that, the, that kind of withdrawal rate um, difference is interesting because you know, one of the things that we discuss a lot in, so far is kind of getting students to take ownership of the material. And so sometimes I, th I think a lot of what we see in the inquiry-based classrooms is this, you know, decrease in the withdrawal rates, which is huge for us when we're trying to get more majors in the STEM field. 
And uh, some other kinds of assessments um, that the faculty involved in this method undertook involved not only success rate in the course or studying withdrawal rates, but also what do students retain moving on from a POGO classroom. So one of the things um, that happened in this particular um, was a large public university, big class sizes. Um, students had uh, done um, organic chemistry one in different formats, some of them in lecture, um, some of them using POGO methods. And in their Organic 2 class, at the beginning of their, their Organic 2 class, they had an unannounced quiz, all the students. This Organic 2 class was a lecture class. And this was about a month after they had taken the final exam and, and passed it for Organic 1. And um, so I don't know if you can see the colors very well. Uh, so we're comparing the students that had taken Pogel in Organic 1 versus the students that had been in the lecture Organic 1. So the blue, which is the, the thing to notice is the very large bar on the left of the blue, um, which were the lecture students scored between a 0 and a 49% on this quiz. So obviously that's problematic um, for lecture uh, compared to, uh, you know, still a large percentage, um, but a lot smaller for the students who had done Pogel in Organic 1. And as you look across the scale, you notice these same differences and you look towards the higher achieving students also, there were none of them in the lecture class who had gotten um, these high grades on, the, on, this, on this quiz. So um, that's something of interest. We're interested not only can students do well in their class, but what did they carry on to the next class? And on top of that, um, how well do they do in their next classes? So that's something of interest. And can they only do well in a Pogel environment, or can they also do well in a follow-up lecture environment? So as a follow-up to this um, first type of investigation, there were students who had been, again, in the lecture versus the Pogel Organic Chemistry 1 class, and they all got put into this Organic Chemistry 2, which was just lecture. So the, I don't know if you can see, the darker colors are the students who came from the lecture. And um, we looked at this, these uh, researchers looked at the course, average course grades in organic chemistry two for students that had been in the lecture versus the Pogel, and there was a significant difference in the grades. So not only were the students in the Pogel class succeeding at a higher rate in their own classes, they were retaining more at the beginning of organic chemistry two and had somehow learned some tools that made them successful in a follow-up course, even though this follow-up course was a lecture course. So that was quite powerful. So um, a lot of this Karen was mentioning in, in her talk, and we've, you know, we've heard this, but the Pogel approach is a very cons constructivist approach. You know, uh, I think we used to think that we could just kind of open up the students' brains and implant the knowledge into their long-term memory, and that was going to work, because obviously it worked for us, right? Um, well, no, it actually didn't, but we th thought it did. Um, but no, that's not what happens, right? And so a lot of times we have this experience of having to jog the student's memory, um, kind of, you know, remind them of the things that they might know. Um, but what often happens is when I'm talking, is it might be happening right now, because I'm talking to you, um, is that there's this filter, right, and it's preventing preventing what I'm what I really mean what my true meaning is from coming through and so what's in that what's in that filter you know your preconceived ideas your um, you know for students a lot it's their misconceptions it's their fears their you know dislike of something or their like of something else and so um, when you're lecturing like I am now you you kind of can guess sometimes at what the misconceptions are but you really can't get a handle on that. And so um, one of the things that, you know, the Pogel environment is these small group settings. And we kind of, you know, have this thing where we walk around. And you know, a lot of you do that, I'm sure. But you can really learn a lot about what's contained in the student's filter when you are listening to them. You know, so somebody who only lectures might say to me, well, how do you know what you're, you know, what, what's actually getting through to the students. And my contention is you know a lot more from listening to the students what's getting through to the students than if you're just talking at them, right? So 
Um, so what is POGA? What do those things stand for? So Catherine mentioned that there's this, this, uh, this acronym stands for Process Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning. So I know you, you are very familiar <laughs> with inquiry learning um, at this conference, but what does that process oriented mean and how do these things come together? Um, so the process oriented is that POGL has identified these certain process skills. And those process skills um, are listed here, but you can get at these skills very easily. And I, I've actually heard uh, Mike Starbird, when he gives his talk, he'll say, you know, what do you want your students to know 20 years from now or something like that. And most of the time it's not factoring quadratic equations, although I'm sure that may come up. But even if you ask the students, you know, what do you think employers want? Um, so these process skills that, you know, some of the things that you've, you've been talking about since at this conference, these are the things that, that we want the students to, to gain from these environments, right? To be able to process information, to be able to think critically, solve problems, and work on their communication skills, work on teamwork, because most of them are going to be working in a, in a cooperative environment when they, when they leave. Um, and management assessment and self-assessment, these things are very important. And so um, you can actually get the students to come up with these things themselves if you, if you ask them the right questions. So Pogel has some resources to try to, to get student buy-in. So the thing about Pogel is that these process skills are put right up at the front. And it's one of the objectives. So in addition to having content objectives for each activity, they'll have process skill objectives as well. So those will be put before the students and you know it's it's clear that we're working on communication or we're working on teamwork and so that is um, put right there at the forefront of the activity and then we have this guided inquiry um, model um, so we have these activities that are are it's a, it's a guided inquiry it's not a pure inquiry so that's that's what that POGL stands for and the guided inquiry are based on what you all know as the learning cycle activities. So um, this is a CARPLUS model based on work of Piaget. Um, fits in with the constructivist um, um, philosophy of learning. And it involves an initial exploration based on some experience, some data, some model. Um, and then based on this exploration, students come to a concept invention and they come to um, being able to define certain things and then the thing that they've discovered or the concept that they've discovered gets applied to some other situation and um, then that cycle may, may start again or may go to another concept. So this is very familiar. We're preaching to the choir with this kind of thing to this audience. Um, but, but that cycle is used to build the POGL activity. So, um, so, and this is in many areas, and that's what we're working on in the mathematics and the Calc 1 right now. So the activity itself, each of the activities is designed to be a first introduction to the topic and, and some certain concept that we're interested in examining. And to do that, to begin that exploration cycle, we might start with some kind of a model and we have a series of questions that the students are working on in groups to answer. And so as an example of a model, what does a model mean? It can be a set of data, it can be a table, it can be a series of graphs, it can be a number of things. Um, so here is an example of something that would be maybe a pre-calculus when we're interested in examining functions or a review activity for Calc 1 a very starting activity and we're interested in studying functions. So the, the big concept here would be functions. And the models, it's important to develop models and it's very difficult to develop models that are rich enough that students can look at them and um, get enough information out of them and have some discussion based on these guided questions. And another key um, thing about the models, especially the beginning models in the activity, so the first model, is that you want to have something that is accessible in some way. So here, we're not using any technical language. We're not using any um, mathematical notation, really. Um, and later, that will get introduced. But this is quite accessible. And we're talking about changing colors, or taking a face, or switching letters around. So students like this. They get, they get involved right away. And that's actually a very powerful part of the activities. The students get interested immediately. And then they're, 
motivated to work on the rest of the problem. So as some first easy questions, as that initial exploration guided questions, um, we might give some input, we might give another shape and ask students to tell us what the output of machines A and B are. Or we might give them a series of letters and ask them what the output of machine C is. So that would be a beginning um, st starting point for that exploration. And then after um, that initial exploration and maybe some more, so there's some scaffolding, some more um, maybe less directed questions. Um, uh, we say here terms are introduced. What I, what I mean by that, I don't mean that we tell students what the definition of something is. What we want is for students to come up with their own definitions. So we don't want to be telling them what a function is, but we want to be providing them data and models that allows them to come to that definition. But we do provide them with some vocabulary, so we may give them the word function. So we started with a machine, and then we'll say, okay, some of these machines are functions and some of them aren't. Uh, you know, try to come up with a definition of what, what the difference is and what, what constitutes a function. And um, then once they've come up with that concept invention piece, we then um, give them other questions in which they work together in these groups to apply this concept to a new situation. So uh, creating a new machine or examining um, a certain set of data and coming up with a function. And maybe using appropriate notation that's been introduced. So that's the, um, the big picture of what an, a Pogel activity looks like. And um, the challenging piece, of course, as all of you know, in any inquiry-based learning or more method or in this maybe more structured guided inquiry is the implementation is very, can be very difficult. And so we're gonna talk a little bit now about imp implementation and we're gonna show you a couple of very short videos. So what I would like you guys to do is to take out your pens and you have your little yellow pads and you can write on your white paper if you like. <laughs> and um, just, we're gonna show you two sh very short videos and just to write down anything you notice about these videos. So write one or two things down about each video, maybe how they compare or anything you would like to make a comment about on these videos. Okay, that was classroom A. So this was taken from one of my colleagues um, who's on our math team um, at Rockhurst University. Um, and and uh, they, when she first started working with us on Pogol, um, she w had a lot of experience with, with working um, on group activities because her department basically has developed this set of activities and they, you know, everybody uses this set of activities and it often looked <laughs> like classroom A. Um, and so she, you know, when she first started working with Pogo, she's like, well, I already have all these activities. Um, but then, you know, as soon as she started hearing about Pogel and the, the ideas for implementation and the idea strategies for working with groups, um, it really, it really um, was eye-opening for her. So um, certainly, I, I mean, for me, I, I just feel so bad for this young man who is wanting to look at that guy's paper and talk to him and ask him, but he doesn't have the vocabulary. He doesn't have the structure or anything that will allow him to kind of interact with that person sitting next to him. And then this, this young man in the, uh, in the front with the green t-shirt is furiously working through this activity and flipping through his pages without you know, having, any, having any kind of uh, 
interaction with the group. And so this was representative of what was going on in her class, kind of pre and post Pogel, as you can imagine which one is which. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people come and they ask me about, you know, talking to them about how to get the groups to work. And so, you know, most of us have found out that, you know, simply saying, okay, work together, go ahead. <laughs> you know, okay, we're sitting next to each other, but is that, does that mean I'm working? Um, and so what happens is that the good students find a way to get through the activity um, on their own, right? And, um, and so even for the difficult tasks that might require, you know, collaboration or for, for that one young man who was maybe struggling to try to get some help from his peers, he didn't really have the skills to say, okay, let's work together on this, or what, what is going on in your paper, or what are you flipping your page for? Um, and, and so what, what the Pogel um, kind of uh, network has developed is, are some strategies for, for working with these things um, and strategies to get the, the groups to work together. And they've worked well in the university setting, in small and large classrooms, and in the high school setting. So they've been very powerful. And one thing that we've already talked about is the structure of the activity and how that's designed to kind of force the students to work together, um, cues that might be in the activity itself. But um, kind of helping the students to have um, a way of talking to each other and a way of leading, you know, kind of making sure that everybody has, takes a leadership role are, the, are these, these roles that are um, often rotated. And here's an example. There are other roles that people assign, um, readers or things like that. And so these, you know, you might have a manager, a recorder, a spokesperson, a strategy, a reflector who has to report out or whatever. So there's, you know, they, that is one big thing in Pogel is are these assignment of the roles and these strategies given to the students to help them fulfill the roles. And in high school, they have folders and they have, you know, a manager might say or a recorder might say or things like that to kind of help the students along to try to um, get it. And you might find, you know, when your students, they might like this, they might need it. Sometimes I stress these roles more than others and there's a wide variety of, of modes of implementation to what extent you want to, to do this. But these are just things that the Pogel, um, network has to kind of help with implementation. So we've talked about how hard facilitation is, and you all know how hard facilitation is. And um, we'll leave you a website at the end of the Pogel network. It's very easy. It's pogel.org. Um, and the Pogel network offers some help for faculty concerns. Some of the faculty concerns that came up in, in the talk yesterday, um, concerns about student motivation, getting students to work on the problem at hand, concerns about faculty, concerns about getting through the material, about class pace. And so Pogos developed some activities for motivating students, in particular connected to the process skills and getting them to recognize that the process skills are important. And a lot of the strategies that we've talked about already, which are actually built into the activity itself. And so there's certain milestones that you want to make sure you get to and you have a class discussion, you have one group um, asked to rephrase what another group is saying on a certain uh, key part of your activity. So those things are built into the activities and there's a lot of support um, for Pogol in the Pogol network there. And they have lots of regional workshops actually every summer. And so um, successful implement implementation should achieve some kind of closure. And when I say closure, I mean in terms of the content. So if you have a concept that you've wanted to cover, um, you really want to make sure that you've had that class discussion or you've had the groups interacting or you've had some kind of reporting out that um, achieves some kind of closure and understanding of that particular topic. And the other part connected to the process skills, um, you want to include something in the activities that helps the students uh, with metacognition, with examining how is it that they were able to solve this problem? What is it that were some successful, what were some successful strategies in their group that were um, allowed them to get through a difficult part. Um, what didn't work so well and what might they propose to try next time? So those kinds of things to get students thinking about how to go about solving challenging problems. So um, Judith mentioned our team who's work we are working on creating um, a bank of Calc 1 activities right now and then pre-calc will come next. And we have, so Jill and I are on the math team and we also have um, Stanka and Lori 
Uh, so the first four names there are the mathematicians on the team. And the way we're developing these activities is um, we're writing them together with Andres Stramanis and Rick Moog, who were instrumental in starting the Pogo project. And they are chemists who have become experts at activity authoring. And so we're combining the expertise of their um, knowing how to write a very good activity, coming up with very good models, with our mathematics expertise as well as our classroom experience and experience with other inquiry-based methods. And um, so we've actually come up with a, a, a bunch of activities that we've all tested already in our classrooms, some, some of us um, more than once. And um, Jill's going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And we also have a mathematics education research person who is studying student misconceptions in calculus that come up in the literature and making sure that our activities are addressing those student misconceptions. And what we're really interested in is studying student learning. So she's working on um, figuring out whether these activities are addressing those student misconceptions and after students have been through these activities, whether um, the students are, are doing any better on that score. And um, one more person who's a chemist who is also involved in Pogel is Jennifer Lewis, who's helping us also with those student learning objectives and research. And she's also the evaluator for our, for our grants. So basically, um, our timeline uh, right now, we are in the process of um, testing our calcu Calculus One materials. The authoring team tested them, um, a vast majority of them, in the spring. Um, based on that testing, um, we are doing some revisions to the, the activities, and we'll also, we're also working on you know, the timing, how long it took students to take those activities, and parsing the, the questions out accordingly. Um, and we're also getting feedback from Pogel experts. So our, our, our activities are reviewed by the you know, people in the Pogel project who are experts on the Pogel method. So we're getting feedback from them as well um, and our math ed research component. Um, so we're kind of you know, revising them based on multiple um, viewpoints. And then in the fall, we have even a larger group of beta testers who are going to test our activities. Um, and that is going to occur at a wide variety of institutions, large institutions that you know vary quite a bit uh, geographically in different locations um, in terms of rural or you know uh, urban. The, the students at these institutions vary widely and um, you know public institutions, private institutions. So we have quite a few um, avenues for feedback that are going to occur in the fall. And then we hope to release our Calc 1 uh, materials uh, publicly in the fall of 2013, um, and then get a start on the beta testing um, with the pre-calc materials. And so we've had a lot of people who kind of come to us, and especially high school teachers who do not have the time um, to devote to, to writing activities. And you know, you might have a colleague who might want to try IBL but doesn't have you know, the ability to kind of just go in and create their own materials and maybe for some reason doesn't want to use yours. So these materials are hopefully going to get people, more people involved in doing inquiry-based um, things, kind of ease them in gradually, I guess, to, to that. And another part of, of what we're going to be doing is we are um, going to be doing uh, POGO workshops. The, the POGO, um, organization itself offers regional meetings, but we are going to try to do some workshops, you know, maybe with the math uh, community, some different kinds of workshops specifically for mathematicians. So that is our goal. So please look for us, and if you have some colleagues that might be interested, let us know. Thank you.